Thank you, Dean, for that wonderful introduction. And we have had a terrific night of speakers. And I'm just uh, overwhelmed and pleased to uh, be here to respond. Um, we have been fortunate enough to be in the presence of two wonderful giants in this area, and I don't think we have uh, applauded them or lauded them well enough. So please help me to thank them once again for those excellent lectures. As I stand tonight, I don't stand as one who has a great track record in uh, ecology or has a wonderful track record in environmental issues or environmental justice. I just stand as an individual who has listened and who has been a part of something that I think is special here tonight and something that's going on in my community now in terms of our need and ability to respond to the crisis that is before us. We are, and uh, the African American community, in a dire strait in some ways because as most of you realize, some of you realize, others of you may not, um, what ends up happening in any city development is that the best pieces of land go first, and that which is left over is usually the least. And so what happens is that many of the black and brown communities become places that are built in areas that are the least likely that anyone want to live. But the places that are next to those polluting places, those trash dumps, they're the places next to the factory, next to the, what would become the brownfield. They're the places that are right on top of what used to be hat-making shops that put its chemicals into the water stream. They're the places that are where, right by what was brass mill, where the water would flow after the cleansing of the brass and right into the Northern Tuck Valley. They're the places in Bridgeport where it would be just a, a city block, if you will, but Mount Trashmore would rise there in what would be equivalent to a soccer field. Where people would look over at Mount Trashmore and see the handiwork of people who just did not care, who would leave their environmental waste behind and in that one neighborhood, or that one area, on that one street on Central Avenue would develop a 30 foot five, 35 foot high Mount Trashmore as it became known. We'd watch that same place over and over, year after year, as politicians argued about its need to be cleaned up, as people realized, and the fire department told them that it was burning underneath, as vermin were coming in and out, they would look and see this place there that was developing worse and worse every day. It was not simply the stench that came from it, or the fear of walking by it, that your children could be bitten, or any of that. It was the fact that it had an address. And we were right in the heart of the urban community. People had to look at it every day. But what one has to understand is that's, that's one thing, but it is not just that it was there. It was that it was allowed to linger there while city fathers argued over and over again about what ought to be done when all of us wondered what would happen if they moved it a few blocks the other way. What kind of speed could have been picked up that that three-acre little slot, that old little place there was no bigger than a soccer field, might have been repaired, might have been fixed up, might have been changed. It is not that we have made mistakes. No, we've made mistakes. But part of what has happened is that the benign neglect of how to fix the mistakes or where to fix the mistakes or where to put the money at has created a greater problem and even a sense of carelessness and nobody cares people just watch other folks struggling and suffering so I don't, I don't come tonight I don't come tonight talking simply about the consequences I know the consequences but I, I actually believe in, in all honesty that people do not always respond to consequences even when it's in their best interest you and I may know consequences, but we actually act on what we want to act on. 
if consequences and the conversation about them were really going to make change, then most of us would have made changes we haven't made yet. Because we are not dominated in our decision making by the consequences of our actions. If it were so, people would have stopped having unprotected sex a long time ago. If it were so, folk would have stopped driving and texting. If it were so, smoking cessation rules and laws would not be in effect. We would not have to put it on a package of cigarettes or anything else. If it were so, we would not eat all the tasty, delectable, and delightful food that we know we should not eat, present company included. <laughs> no, consequences don't always shape our lives. Sometimes people even joke about consequences. One person says, everything I like is either illegal, immoral, or fattening. <laughs> no, but, but these, these wonderful people have led us in tonight is to thinking a little bit differently about life and to think a little bit different about what we can do for this environment. Think a little differently. And with that, I want to I want to raise three things. I hope that as you're here this week, you'll you'll think through just those three things. I won't be long. I promise you. First of which is I think that we're going to have to really put emphasis on communication, communication. And when I offer the word communication, I do not simply mean words spoken. Words spoken mean nothing. I don't care what you think about 45, he is a great communicator. Every morning on his throne, he sends out a tweet. He keeps on his base over and over again, telling him what he wants to know. He makes up words that become a part of the lexicon of the English language. Matter of fact, he uses obscure words that we all begin to start using jokingly because he's actually created something in our consciousness. And subconsciously, whatever you think, he has learned to effectively communicate with people that support his cause and his needs. And what we need to do is we need to look back and say, what can be learned from his communication? I know people said Ronald Wilson Reagan was a great communicator, but I hate to tell you, he ain't got nothing on Donald J. Trump. <laughs> but one has to ask ourselves, is how do we communicate our cause? Uh, some of you might have uh, seen, you, you're as old as I am, and we have at least one beautiful, lovely, super intelligent octogenarian in the room, Dr. M.T. Winters. You, <laughs> birthday girl. You, you, you would remember the movie Cool Hand Luke. In the movie Cool Hand Luke, captain comes out and he's talking to Paul Newman's character and Paul Newman's character has been listening to the jangling of chains and he doesn't want to deal with the chains and he tells him you got to get used to it and Paul Newman gives him a look that he doesn't like and acts in a manner and they toss him down the hill and what captain says is what we have here is a failure to communicate <laughs> and I want to suggest to you that a part of our problem is not information, but communication. Sometimes I go through the drive through to get a coffee. I, I, I still like coffee, even in the summertime. I don't like it iced. I wonder how if I won't drink it. Let me just have my coffee. And I go through and I make my order. And some people on the other end say, anything else? And I ask, would you read back to me what I just said? And inevitably, every other time, they have failed to glean the words that were coming out of my mouth, Chris Rock. Yeah. Yes. They, they lose it. They can't get it. They don't understand what I said. And I may have to repeat it several times to get it. See, because communication is not the fact that I said it. It's whether or not you got it. Sometimes you can talk and talk. And folks don't understand you. They don't get where you're coming from. They don't understand your passion. They don't understand the cause. 
And the real reason, and so I do think we have to re-examine how communication is done. You know, and you go to foreign country and you see it happen all the time. Person understand what the other person is saying. So the person who is the foreigner begins to speak louder. Yeah. As though speaking louder is going to make it more effective. I'm saying that for a cause because sometimes we think that what we need to do is speak louder in this community of those of you and us, I, that care about ecology, that care about climate change, that care about what's going on. But I want to tell you, it is not always that we need to speak louder. Sometimes we need to speak more efficaciously. Here it is, but it's not only communication, but communication leads me to something else. It is communication that makes connection. Because see, if I don't make a connection, then you're not going to get it. Um, man was in a factory job, and uh, they were changing over policies, and, and they had everybody on the job needed to sign off on the new policy change. And so uh, everybody in the factory had signed off, but there was this one guy who had not signed off on the policy change. And so his, uh, his foreman went and talked to him, and he told him, I'm not signing nothing. OK. The supervisor, the foreman, went to talk to him and said, you have to sign. Everybody has to sign that they understand this, that you have gotten this, you understand the job, you understand what we're going to be doing. I'm not signing nothing. They went to the big boss. The big boss came down and talked to him. He only said this, either sign it or you're fired. The man took the pen and signed it. He, he, the boss up there said, your, 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 your foreman came. Your supervisor came. What changed when I came? He said, nobody ever explained it to me. <laughs> you, you need to make me know why it matters to me. Because if you can't make me know why it matters to me, then it really doesn't matter. Because that's when you're going to connect with me, is when you make me understand why it matters to me. Now, some of you sitting here, you're a delightful, lovely-looking, wonderful audience of all wonderful, gorgeous people who look well. I want to tell you this. Some, most of you function out of pure altruism. You do right because doing right is good. You like doing right. You're good people. You think good. You want the best for the world. You dream about how to make the world a better place. You're happy about it. You, you walk around and you carry roses and sunshine with you. you, you when you walk in the room, people feel better just because you're there. You light up the room. You come in when you walk in. The sun just came in the room because you brought it in. Your smile is radiant. You're totally altruistic, but, 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 but I want to tell you, everybody doesn't function on your altruism. Most folk need a reason they're going to do something. Because people ask this question almost in every situation. It's a simple one. What's in it for me? What's in it? for me. The Bridgeport community has been involved in the Battle of Mount Trashmore, and week after week after week, churches would gather there, right there on Central Ave, standing out there. Jesse Jackson came to town, and every time you come in, stand out there. Every civil rights leader, stand out there. Uh, I don't know any other issue that would have brought them out there, but they understood what was in it for them? Now, now some of you you, you, you won't get it that way, so let me give it to you another way. The, the folk in Virginia Beach have a Mount Trashmore, too. Maybe you don't know about that. Because their Mount Trashmore is 165 acres. That's their Mount Trashmore, 165 acres. The Mount Trashmore in Bridgeport, the size of a soccer field. The Mount Trashmore in Virginia Beach, 165 acres. 
Uh, I want you to know people came out of sport. They worked for it because what they ended up with were lakes and waterways, fisheries, a skate park so large that even Tony Hawk, the great professional skater, wanted to come and skate on it. The park for their children is so beautiful that even when they had a fire there and it burned down, they did a renovation project for over a million dollars and put it back together and made it a little bigger. In their skate park, in their park, they've got, they've got all kinds of picnic areas and parking spaces and laid out like you wouldn't believe because the people there wanted something for themselves. They could get something out of it. So I need to tell you that we need to help people see what they can get from the support. Yeah, but that's what makes me nervous, y'all. That's what makes me nervous. Anecdotally, mind you, it's, it's anecdotal. It, it is anecdotal. I, I, there's no reason for me to even say anything, but I need to help you understand how people feel. You might as well understand this. You got millions of dollars to help Virginia Beach, a beautiful community right on the ocean side. But you couldn't get a few measly million to take care of a soccer field? 165 acres and millions went there, but you couldn't take care of a three acre soccer field? And right now, they just now cleaned in the 90s. They cleaned up the trash, but the field's still vacant. And I know it's just anecdotally, but you gotta understand how folk don't feel about that. I don't begrudge them in Virginia Beach. I've seen that. I like that myself. But I do wonder why there's no equity. Let me close. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave this. I'm gonna leave you here. I, I want communication, I want a connection, but I'll, I'll stop with this and, and I'm, I'm done. I wanna leave you with where both of you stop today. As faith communities, I wanna leave you with this. That is all about consecration. I want you to understand, I believe that if people of faith would look at our faith traditions, read our books, read our sacred texts, we can shift this from being just a political and public debate to being one that had sacred duty attached to it. One that was a way of responding not just to one another, but responding to God. We can say to God, we've been good stewards over the place you've given us to be stewards over. We've taken care of the earth that you put in our hands. We have watched and covered it. We've taken care of it. We, we want to make this now a consecrated duty. It's consecration. And I, I go to my seat with this. I, I feel like preachers. So I better stop. Fanny Crosby put it best in her great hymn, Nearer, Draw Me Nearer. It's in that second line where she said, Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. By the power of grace divine, let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Let us be consecrated that our wills will be subject to the will of a higher power and in so doing, will do a great work even in this place.